Hello everybody, I'm back for another lesson in, um, in sculpture. I, um, I'm starting here with where we left off last week, uh, but I want to um, begin our next assignment. Our next assignment is to replicate a leaf, and I've gone out in my backyard and I've found a couple leaves that I can choose from. They're, it's early spring, so so they might, uh, you know, there, there's not a huge um, selection, but we certainly have a lot of different things that we can choose from. This is the only one I know uh, the species, which is um, rhubarb. Uh, my wife grows rhubarb in the garden and it comes up very early in the year, so I took a piece of the leaf off. Um, but the first thing I wanted to do was uh, clean off this, this work surface. Uh, this is how far I got last week. Now, I want to um, erase this so that I can do my next project. Uh, you want to make sure that what you, you don't erase until you take a good photograph, you're happy with it, we take a good photograph of your flames, you submit it, and then you can erase it. So, uh, right now I'm going to erase this. And it's simply taking, in this case I'm just using my butter knife, and I'm going to take that off. I always like to start with a bed of clay. It's, um, it helps when the color of the clay is different than the color of the wood. That's the first thing. But also it gives me the opportunity to not just model the object that, I'm, that I want to uh, describe, but also how it, how it weaves into the background possibly. But it also gives me an opportunity to um, do, do effects with, with, um, that we had dealt, dealt with last week. So I'm going to just add a little bit more clay, maybe make this square a little bit larger. And then, uh, and then I will start. The other couple things that I wanted to uh, mention is that I wanted to go back to this tool. This is going to be my primary tool. And remember what I said, that if, if, um, if you don't have your tools at home, I don't expect anything really complex. But this, all it was is a, um, it's an old uh, uh, chopstick from takeout, and I just took my uh, X-Acto knife or my uh, utility blade, and what I'm going to do is either whittle it to a point, or in this case I'm going to flatten it. So I'm going to actually flatten that surface and then maybe round it over. I can have a point on this side or a dull point, but in this case what I'd like to do is just flatten it. And you can see I'm just pushing, you see how I'm working that. I'm holding it here, putting it against, using two thumbs, and this is your standard whittling technique. So. Uh, not only did we uh, are we learning something about sculpture, but a little bit about whittling as well. Um, I'm also going to use that to you know, cut it off, maybe make something a little duller. Okay. I can also, if you have sandpaper at home or even a, any rough surface um, or whatever you want to do. Um, so I cut this, and you can see there's a little concavity there. It's a little flat, uh, but it's also a little bit concave, if you can see that. So I just wanted to quickly go over, again, some of the different forms of relief sculpture that you might find in art history. Relief sculpture is a very important part of art history. It's mainly found uh, on architecture, but not solely. Uh, things like coins will almost always have some sort of a relief on them, uh, but also in jewelry and decorative work. You can find it in a lot of different places. Uh, so it is an extremely important part of art history and uh, sculptural history. The three main uh, types of, of uh, sculpture or relief sculpture is the bas relief, the mezzo relief, and the alto relief. So let me just describe those here. I'm going to draw a substrate or a wall. So we got three different examples. The first example will be a bow relief, right? And this is in cross section, which means that we're looking at it from the side rather than the, from the front. The bow relief, the mezzo relief, and the alto relief. The first bow relief is usually very shallow or low. Ba means low. So that the if I were to model a sphere on this cross section, it might look something very much like this. In other words, very shallow, compressed, and 
no undercuts, which means there's no, there's no modeling around the form. It ends at the surface. A mesorelief might be attached, but almost fully formed, but really nothing behind it. But it's bigger. It's, it's a deeper dimension. It's usually compressed a little bit. And this is used for things where you need to see it from a, a greater distance. It'll have deeper shadows and a stronger form. And then of course, you have alto relief, which often means that it's the full object. In this case, you I mean you, the bowl is kind of a, 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 an exaggeration of this idea, but it's the full object. And you might find that in a niche or niche or, um, a pediment where there's a, a pretty much a fully formed sculpture, but it's set into a spot where they you really can't see the back side. So this is technically called an alto relief. And that's uh, that's how I break it down. Uh, some people might define these in in some different ways, but what's important that that you're dealing with is the idea that ba means low, and alto means high, mezzo means middle. Another type of relief that you might find in particularly a, in Egyptian architecture is what's called sunken relief. And that's where you might find the, the work carved into a surface. For example, like this, and then you have this, the object and then back out. And that you might find in a, an Egyptian a hieroglyph wall carving. So those are the types of relief that um, are categorized in some way. But you can find them in a lot of different forms. And you may also find that in the same composition, you might find high relief for foreground, meso relief for middle ground, and bas relief for background. You know, maybe there's wisps of clouds that are fully compressed, but the figures out front are, are alto relief. Now I'm gonna be creating a relief of this leaf. And a relief is a three-dimensional form. And this leaf is a three-dimensional form. And so what I don't want to necessarily do is take this leaf and crush it down. Because one of the things about the leaf is it's, it's tremendous three-dimensionality. We think that it's a flat surface, but really it is not. So I want to build in all of this depth inside here, which I assume has something to do with funneling water down towards the stem and, and capturing light in a certain way. So all these things are going to be important to my modeling. So what I don't want to do is pin it down or flatten it. So I want to be able to pick it up and move it around. So what I might do is I'm going to, use, I'm going to do it from this direction so that I can have my left hand up in the air and kind of moving it around. And this is very much an interpretation uh, three-dimensionally. So I'm going to hold it here and I'm going to work down here. So the first thing I'd like to do is give the, a line for the stem, right? And that stem kind of comes up and then I'm going to decide, and this is going to be slightly bigger than where, what the leaf is. And I'm going to draw it, maybe the, the leaf begins down here and then weaves it up, its way up and then comes. I like to make it a little bit bigger than what it really is. I'm going to try to draw this dark so that you can see it. I think it's more like, I think it's like that, right? Here's that center stem. The other side, I do want it to kind of riffle up like this and roll in on itself. So it'll be something like that. Looks pretty good. So the first thing I'll do is I'm going to pull this off of the edge. So you could either go through and, and peel this back with your tool, either like this or with your, any tool that you have. But one of the things that I really like to do is get a good outline going. And that outline, you saw that the first line here is a, is a good guess, but there's a lot of different things I can do with it. But the first thing ultimately I want to do is establish the size, the shape, the outside border of it. Um, you could either dig away the outside like this. This especially works well if you have a loop tool at home. But if you don't have a loop tool at home, then one of the things you can do is instead of incising it, is start to build that outside border with some actual, actual dimension. And that's ultimately where we want to go. So I'm going to start building some dimension in. And you'll notice that what I'm actually doing is taking a bead of clay, like this, maybe a little bit smaller, and then I'm going to take that line, maybe a little bit of a, of a gnocchi there, if, you're, if you know what I'm talking about, and you start there and then you kind of peel it back in like this with your thumb. So, if you remember from the Donatello episode, there's a term that the Italians use for this type of, of relief, and it's called stacciato. And that stacciato relief just means flat. But it also means that the relief itself becomes much more painterly and um, dimensional. Whereas traditional relief, especially in Gothic, uh, Egyptian, Greek, 
the the reliefs were very graphic, deep, and um, what's called planar to the picture plane, or or uh, parallel to the to the picture plane, which means that there was no depth. All the action happened on a, a flat plane. But with Staccato, there is a play with the way the light and effect is is working to create an illusion of much more space. So we want to play with that. We want to do a little bit with that, where we're gonna um, we're gonna want that dimensionality for our leaf. You can see, see that it's it's not hard to to really begin to create dimensionality. And to give an illusion of it. So now that I've kind of created that shape, I can start to build in some of the some of the minor forms or the the secondary forms. And this one is curling back in. So a lot of this, I'm going to see some of the, the outside of it, and then it curls in on itself. And this is a really nice thing, because so, it's going to want to go like this. It's going to come in on itself and showing the outside. So I'm going to want to see a large rim up here of that leaf that comes in. Actually, I should do this the other way. So what I'm actually going to do I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this rim that comes in and overlaps. So now I'm going to go go from the other direction. And I'll end it right in there, something like that. And I'll take this off and flatten it. It's starting to look pretty good. And it comes over here. The next thing I might do, here's that center line. Now, you probably learned in high school that there's these veins and everything, and uh, that's certainly helpful, but notice that, that it's not really the vein that's important, it's the shape in between the vein and the rolls because of the way that the, the leaf will start to kind of um, crinkle in on itself because of the expansion of the, of the growth forms. So that we, we might draw in some of these veins but they're really defining convexities. They're defining that this becomes a convex form, right? And then it's next to this convex form over here, over here. So this convex form next to this convex form. And of course, this is gonna be more subtle, more subtle still, more subtle. But there's a series of convexities. Now, what I would normally do here is have a variety of tools. Now, if you don't have your tools because of our situation, then uh, you're going to have to um, just use your fingers and the tools that are available. But um, one of the tools that you would use in this situation is the small rake tool. 